Hello, and welcome to another edition of Critical Q&A, the show where I answer your questions based on what you have sent me by email at askchrisshelton at gmail.com or have left for me in the comments section of my Q&A videos. Hey, everybody. Welcome to my show, and thank you, as always, for inviting me into your home this week. I am um, just always so happy to be able to do this. So um, I wanted to put a plug in for my podcast that I posted yesterday because I thought it was a really important one. There was a documentary dropped on uh, Hulu. I think there's a parallel documentary on Peacock about the um, sex cult, you could say, labor trafficking as well, cult, of Larry Ray, a man who has now been completely, thoroughly, and totally busted and is now going to be serving the next 60 years in jail uh, for doing monstrous things to a group of eight college kids out of Sarah Lawrence University. And uh, this is a very harrowing tale of um, being caught in a vortex, you could say, of coercive control that Larry Ray created all on his own with these students and really ruined some lives uh, for a long period of time, 10 years, before they finally broke away, prosecuted this guy, put him in jail, and are recovering from that experience and living to tell the tale and talk about it and, and really move on with their lives and get on with things. And so I had an opportunity to um, interview one of those survivors and the director of the documentary that dropped on Hulu. So I really hope you guys will check that out. It is Probably this documentary is probably one of the best I've seen at showing right in right in your face with video what actual gaslighting looks like. Not the nonsense you hear about on social media. Oh, he gaslit me because somebody lied to you or told you something you didn't want to hear or, you know, deceived you in some fashion. Gaslighting is a much, much more significant activity than that. And it is shown in this uh, in this documentary what that's all about. So I really recommend you guys check that out. We really need as a society. I'm just going to keep plugging this, even though I'm really just a you know a little candle in the wind on this, just uh, you know just trying to push back against the tide. But you know we really need to do better with our language and our terminology and the way we use diagnostic labels and uh, these terms like gaslighting, like grooming these days. This is the next hot topic word I see being bandied about way too liberally on social media. People have really no idea what this word means or the depth of the intent of what grooming and the long-term, you know, uh, sort of campaign that that, what that really means you know, we see this being being the latest buzzword. So I really want to push back against the misuse of narcissist, gaslighting, grooming, these kinds of words. They mean something significant for a reason, and they should be used in proper context and, and with the full magnitude of what the word actually means. And when people just use these and abuse these words to describe much, much, much less, uh, you know, serious behavior, then it just waters down the message when we're trying as professional cult specialists or coercive control experts or people who are in this field, psychologists, sociologists, you know, when we talk about this stuff, we're trying to get across to y'all that this is impactful, important stuff that actually messes with people in serious and significant ways. But when y'all take the words and misuse them, and, you know, I have to admit, I've been guilty of this myself, and it's kind of like lesson learned and try to pass it on, you know, is kind of my point here. Um, we really do ourselves a disfavor and a disservice, and we do the victims of this stuff a horrible disservice. So anyway, I just want to put that out there for all of you. Now, let's get on with your questions. Michael Yoder, in a lecture to auditor trainees in the 1960s in England, Hubbard talked about two things, out rudiments and instant reads. Around instant reads on the e-meter, he also mentioned random, latent, and prior reads. Oh, great brain, what are these types of readings and what are out rudiments? Okay, these are basic terms in Scientology auditing, actually. Every single auditor knows these terms in Scientology, especially once you learn how to use an e-meter. So let's go ahead and go over this. First off, every single auditing session in Scientology is supposed to start with what are called the rudiments, the rudiments of the session, the fundamental parts of the session 
all in place. And that means uh, part of that is not only having an auditor in the room with an e-meter and paper and all that and a desk and chairs, but also a pre-clear, a person who's going to be audited has to have certain physical conditions in place, like they can't be hungry and they can't be tired. If you're physically tired at the start of a session, you're not supposed to be going in session. And you're supposed to have had a good night's sleep or at least a decent amount of sleep before you get going. And the e-meter has various tests that they use in order to verify these things, which they want well, the most important one called the, uh, the, the uh, deep breath, taking a deep breath on the e-meter. When you're holding the cans the, and you get it all set up and the sensitivity correctly set for the person who's holding the cans, then the auditor will tell the pre-clear, take a deep breath, hold it for just a moment, let it out through your mouth or take a deep breath and let it out. And um, the person will go, you know, and take a deep breath. And the meter is supposed to show a response, a surge um, that sh- that indicates that the person has is well fed and well rested. So um, those are what are called your body rudiments. OK, now, once the session actually starts, there's another set of questions that are asked in order to make sure that the person's attention is right here focused on the here and now and is not caught up in some problem or some wrongdoing that they have their attention on or they're distracted by or there's some upset that they have. There's a problem or issue that they are literally upset about with another person or situation. And those three things, an ARC break, a present time problem, or an overt or a missed withhold are the rudiments that are checked in a session because these are the things Hubbard said will throw you out of session and you will be distracted to the point that you can't have your attention on your own case, on your own issues and problems from the past that you want to deal with because these present time issues are so distracting to you. And so these rudiments are questions that are checked at the beginning of every session to ensure that these things aren't present and that everything is good to go. And the auditor is watching the needle to see that it floats. The needle has to kind of do this loose rhythmic sweep of the dial back and forth kind of thing in response to being asked about these rudiments to ensure everything is good to go and the person's in a good mood and ready to rock. Okay, and that's how sessions are supposed to start Uh, for the most part. There are exceptions to all these rules, but for the most part, majority of cases, majority of sessions, this is how you have to start. So, um, for example, the rudiment, the three basic rudiment questions, there's a total of six that you can check. But these the, the basic three are, do you have an ARC break? Do you have a present time problem? Do you have a missed withhold or has a withhold been missed? And by a missed withhold is meant not only that you do something bad, you have this withhold, this thing you're withholding, you're not telling, but somebody almost found out about it. And that's a missed withhold is when somebody almost catches you out, right? Or you wonder, do they know? You can't tell if they know, but do they know? Maybe they know. That kind of thing can be quite worrisome to people, right? We've all experienced this. And so these are the rudiments that are checked before a session. So on the e-meter, the auditor will be watching and saying, do you have an ARC break? And if the needle goes, hey, no problem, no reads, no responses, needles floating, good. We're not going to take that up. If it does respond, if there is a reaction on the meter, then the auditor will come and say, well, do you have an ARC break, you know, and deal with it and see what the person says. And, and there's a little procedure for handling that until the needle floats. That's the only thing they're looking for is that floating needle. Then they'll check, do you have a present time problem? And if the guy says, you know, if there's a response, oh, yeah, no, I got this problem with my mom or I got this problem with my boss or I got this problem with my wife or whatever the problem is. Good. Tell me about it. And if that doesn't resolve it and the needle doesn't float when the person tells about it, then they'll say, is there an earlier similar problem? And they'll go back down the line until the needle floats, right, when you're talking about it. And then there is the missed withhold. Uh, Has a withhold been missed? Doing, oh, what's that, right? And that means you're going to end up confessing or, or, or coughing up some wrongdoing you engaged in, right? Whether it was, 
you know, uh, yelling at your spouse or whether it was hitting your kid or whether it was having a, you know, uh, whatever, whatever you did, you know, that that would be a missed withhold, something something you did that now you're wondering whether somebody else actually knows or not. Right. Maybe you um, maybe you didn't uh, maybe you called in sick and you weren't really sick right, to work uh, yesterday, and you feel a little, and your boss said something that made you wonder, do they know, do they know I'm faking it, right, maybe your boss was like, okay, well, hope you're feeling better, and maybe the tone of their voice or something made you think, oh, something's off here, he knows, right, oh, she caught me out, right, that's a missed withhold, and so they'll be looking for that and pulling the, uh, the overt you committed the wrongdoing you committed, right? And uh, and then again, just trying to get that floating needle so that the session itself can actually get going. The rudiments are supposed to be a very quick, very light, no big deal kind of action. It's not a security check. It's not a deep interrogatory into your life. It's just the rudiments. And sometimes Hubbard said that during sessions, the rudiments could go out during the session. And that's middle rudiments and other things. And we don't have to get into any of that right now, but that's just the idea with the rudiments. Um, okay. That's a very Scientological kind of, you know, uh, point. That's a, that's, that's a bit of Scientology technology. The other thing you're asking here about is instant reads. And this was actually very, very, very important in the, in the use of the e-meter up until 1960 or 60, I think it was 1960 Hubbard gave this lecture on e-meters and instant reads. And the meter had already been out for many years and people had been setting it up and using it in an auditing session and asking questions and looking for responses. But Hubbard was pulling people to auditor trainees to England and training them. And he was finding that people were taking reactions that happened on the needle. If this is the needle on the dial, they were taking reactions that were coming way after the fact of asking the questions. And Hubbard said that was wrong. He said, no, 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 no. He said, look, here's the deal. Now, this is all just Hubbard, okay? I'm just explaining it to you. I'm not telling you that this is reality. This is very, very, very far from reality. But in Scientology, this is how an e-meter is used, and it's an important point to know. Um, it's not just that you ask a question. Okay, let's say let's, – let's stop using my finger. Let's say this is the needle on the dial, okay? And uh, let me do it from your end. So this, this, would, this would be the kind – the direction of the kind of – response you'd be looking for. It goes from, from uh, left to right as, as you guys are looking at it. So here's the needle on the dial. And I ask you a question. Um, you know, what do you think of your mother? You see that lag? There was a big lag between the end of my question and the response on the needle. That is called a latent read. It's way late. It's after the fact of the question. What you're looking for on an e-meter is a response that happens instantly at the precise end of the, of the thought that is being voiced by the auditor. So if the auditor says, what do you think of your mother? Right on the R of mother is when that reaction should happen. What do you think of your mother? There is an instant read. Not, what do you think of your mother? Because that's a prior read. It happened while I was still saying the line. What do you think of your mother? See, it happened on the word think, not mother. So it's not the complete thought that's being asked. And therefore, it's not a valid response to the question. That would be a prior read, and it would be an error on the auditor's part to take it up. What do you think of your mother? There we go. There's the instant read. That is a charged question or a hot question on the e-meter. Latent reads and prior reads are ignored completely, utterly, totally. They have no significance at all in modern Scientology. For a period of time in the early uh, days of using the meters and in the training with an e-meter, you will use prior and latent reads um, as a training activity. But, um, but they're not utilized now really in any meaningful sense in Scientology's methods. So it's really only the instant read. And auditors are trained and trained and trained and they use video cameras and they, use, they have films on this stuff to train people into spotting that reaction that happens at the precise 
end. And Hubbard talked in the lectures about how it could be a tenth of a second after and that kind of thing. But then later he said, no, 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 look, it's, it's precise. It's right on that last bit of the R in mother that you're watching for the read, okay? And that's an instant read. And uh, there you go. Nick C., in Scientology, the acronym DB stands for degraded being. In cop shows on TV, DB usually means dead body. In tech, DB is, or perhaps used to be, short for database. I wonder if there have been some funny or bizarre misunderstandings based on this acronym or some other one that means one thing in Scientology and something else in the real world. All right, thank you very much for this, Nick. Uh, I have a, th- I, I, I thought of three things I could share with you here that I thought were kind of humorous misunderstandings we see sometimes. First one is maybe not so humorous because it's a racial slur, and that is that term "wog." And I, you know, and I recognize in saying that 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 is an offensive term. I get that, but I have to say it because you got to have the answer to the question. And in Scientology, when I first heard that term, I had never ever heard it before. Well, sure enough, it's defined in the Scientology Dictionary as an acronym for Worthy Oriental Gentleman. And I did not understand when I was in Scientology, and I don't think a lot of Scientologists do unless they're priorly familiar with this term. They don't really get that that's an ironic use of worthy and that that is an incredibly you know, racially charged term to describe uh, people from the Indian subcontinent in the British racial way that they would go about it. Um, So I thought worthy oriental gentleman was not an ironic term. And I thought it was just some historical term that Hubbard was kind of grabbing at random to use to describe non-scientologists in the same way, in the exact same way, in fact. I, I thought of it exactly the same as how J.K. Rowling had created the term muggle in the magic world to describe somebody who doesn't have any magic, right? Somebody who's not connected with the magic world or has any magical ability is called a muggle. And in fact, I got kind of tired of wog after a long time in Scientology, and I just started calling them muggles. (laughs) I just started referring to non-Scientologists as muggles, and everybody in Scientology that I said that to laughed and thought it was very funny because it's you know, the same, because in their mind, it was the same kind of concept. You know, we weren't bandying that word about in Scientology as a racial epithet. I had never even dawned on me that's how the word was used in the big wide world because I had no connection or, or association with it prior to Scientology. So, um, so that's one th- that is a pretty wild misunderstanding and departure of, you know, of, uh, of concept there. Another one I thought of is ARC, the ARC triangle. This in Scientology is affinity, reality, and communication. ARC is an acronym. But routinely, routinely in the outside world when I'm asked about ARC triangles, I am asked about them as ARC triangles. People think it means the word ARC, which is kind of hilarious to me because it's a triangle, not a curve or an ARC. And so uh, trying to combine those things often confuses people. They're like, what's this ARC triangle? I don't get it. And they don't realize it's an acronym for ARC. Um, and then there is um, the Sea Org, of course. That's the, that's the one I've run into. Because uh, I always go out of my way when I say Sea Organization or Sea Org, that it's S-E-A. I will spell it out for people because routinely they will think it's C hyphen org and they'll wonder what the c stands for (laughs) so um so that's something i've run into many times in the last uh, decade talking about this stuff so those are some immediate answers i thought of i'd be very interested to hear any um any comments from you guys as to other terms or acronyms you've run into in scientology that you have you know either grossly or hilariously misunderstood because it wasn't obvious uh from the acronym what what you were even looking at so there you go Steve Wood, I've often heard you talk about the situation known as pulling it in, whereby if something bad goes wrong in your life, it's your fault because you've done something to make it happen. Prior to being a Scientologist, when those things happened, what was that then? Just dumb luck or misfortune? What makes it your fault when you've paid money to be a Scientologist? Seems to me it's just the same thing as what happened prior to being a Scientologist, but if not, please explain. 
All right. Thank you for this question, Steve. And um, this is just this is not something that is new for Scientologists. That's a very interesting take on this, actually, because I was a little bit like, what? That L. Ron Hubbard's principles and methods and the things that he talks about, all of his theories and reasoning apply to everybody, everywhere, all at once. There is very, very, very little in Scientology that is Scientologist specific that would only apply to you. Here's a principle, but it really only applies to you because you're a Scientologist. That's not that's not at all the take on this. Hubbard was explaining, as in his terms, basic physical laws and basic theta laws as to how theta and, and mass, matter, energy, space, and time, that's Hubbard's acronym for the material world or the physical world is matter, energy, space, time, mast. He refers to the mast universe, and he says that it has certain laws. And he says science gets it wrong routinely on this stuff. And, you know, they don't really understand uh, flows and electronics and how a thetan operates. In other words, how does a non-corporeal spiritual entity that has no wavelength, no location in space or time, how does such an entity interact with the physical universe in the first place, much less control a body? Well, it does it through energy flows, tractor beams, presser beams. It's, it's, it can create energy. The Thetan can, the spiritual entity. And that spiritual entity uses those energy flows, pushing and pulling flows, to accomplish its means or its ends with bodies and with other things. Now, there is also just direct control, Hubbard talks about, where a Thetan just says, boink, and it happens. That no energy flows needed of any kind. But that's high-level stuff. That's the whole point of going OT is you won't have to be admired and enmeshed in all the energy and flows and traps of the physical universe. Because Hubbard claims that not only are Thetans using energy and creating energy at will to manifest their intent, but that these energy flows can also kind of trap you as a spirit. Because once you as a spiritual entity agree that energy is important and that it can be used by you to do things, it can also be used against you, okay? These are basic concepts in Scientology, and um, they're kind of high-level concepts in a way, but I mean, what, but when I say basic, I mean fundamental to understanding Hubbard's entire concept of what a Thetan is and how it interacts with bodies. This isn't day one stuff. I don't mean it's fun. It's basic that way. I mean, it's basic as in it's like really underlying theory for how Scientology operates. So this energy stuff is actually really important to understanding um, Scientology itself and how Hubbard says things work. And he says Thetans use energy. So how? How do they use energy? Well, Hubbard makes some pretty bold claims out of nowhere. And all of this, all of this is covered in 1952 material. This is all coming out of the Philadelphia Doctorate course lectures and similar lectures around that time period. He was really heavily into trying to explain how Thetans work through energy flows. And what he said was that the physical universe operates on what's called the re a reverse vector. You want something, and the physical universe is built to keep it away from you. Right? You reach... The physical universe withdraws. The physical universe reaches, and you withdraw. Now, this is all just Hubbard's nonsense, but this is what he. This is how he says the universe works. So, if you're always, you know, if you're ever wondering why it is that you're working and putting out goals and putting out purposes, this is energy manifestation by you. Is you put out a goal or a target or a purpose and you want it or, you know, like, for example, you're going to go get a girlfriend. You want a girlfriend. You're single and you're like, I want I want a significant other. I want somebody else in my life. Well, just the mere fact of you putting out energy to do that will be met with the reverse energy from other beings and from the physical universe itself. It's all a trap to suck you in and make it so that you can't get what you want. And so you reach the, you know, the universe withdrawals. The universe pushes stuff on you 
and you don't want it. Yeah, I don't want that, right? The universe is giving you problems and car accidents and firing you from your job and all this crap the, that the universe kind of throws at you. And you're like, ah, oh, I didn't want any of this. And you're, you know, you're trying to withdraw from it. Um, now, this, of course, ignores the opposite truths, too, which is the universe. You know, anyway, you understand this is how Hubbard is explaining things. It's a little kooky. It's a little weird. But I'm just trying to und- trying to get across how how Scientologists think about stuff. So this pulling it in thing has to do with energy flows. It has to do with the fact that when you exert an energy towards somebody else, that is destructive or wrong or morally, you know, compromised, or you know you're doing something you really shouldn't be doing. Like, let's say you just walk up and, you know, you Will Smith somebody, you just slap somebody, right, out of nowhere. They didn't deserve it. You didn't, they didn't do anything to to earn that. You just did it out of nowhere, okay? And, um, or maybe you, you know, grossly overreacting, right? They give a little bit of energy and you come back with a mountain full, right? Like a, like a Will Smith. So that is you negatively like exerting energy towards somebody else that they definitely didn't want. And you know, that was wrong. You know, it was right. You know, you shouldn't have done that. And what does that cause in you? A withdrawal. You withdraw from that space. You go, oh my God, I used energy and force and I hurt. I caused destruction. I can't do that again. And you pull back. You go, ah, I don't know. I can't do that again, right? And what does that create? It creates a vacuum. Suddenly there's this vacuum. You were there and now you're not. And there's this vacuum of nothing there. And what happens with a vacuum? It pulls things into it. You see? So what kind of things is it going to pull back into it? Well, in this case, it's going to pull into you now the same kind of crap you pushed out to other people. And so now you're about to get bitch slapped a few times, right? Or you're going to think you are or you're going to think you need to be and you're going to be quite certain of this. And it's going to mess with your head and your psychology quite a bit because you're going to be sitting there going, well, I did this horrible thing and I didn't get anything back, but I really need to get something back because we need to balance the scales here. And so now you're going to pull in all kinds of nonsense on yourself because of this vacuum that you've created around yourself because you're pulling all your flippers in because you can't be doing all those destructive, horrible things. And you know it. And so you go, ah, and you, this is how Hubbard says over time, Thetans reduce their power and their reach and their willingness to reach and their willingness to engage in actions and co-actions with other beings is because they've done bad things and they, uh, I don't want to do bad things. And so then what happens as a result of that is they pull in all this horrible stuff. And he says the only real solution to this is to take is to be willing to be responsible for doing anything, for creating any effect anywhere, anytime on anybody and realizing that it's really not that big of a deal. You know, you're a Thetan, I'm a Thetan, the physical universe is the physical universe. Who cares? We can just create more of it. You know, if you don't like this one, go get another one. Like, it's not really a big deal. Bodies, you know, they're a dime a dozen. You know, you've had billions of them. Why do you have so much? Why do you put so much importance on all of this stuff? It's just stuff, you know, and you can create it anytime you want. Or destroy it anytime we want. And if you're looking at it from a very, very high level, right, tone 40 or thereabouts, a very powerful position as a Thetan, then none of this stuff really means much of anything, right? In the same way, maybe maybe a good comparison might be in the same way that you're, you're, if you have a child and they have toys, right, and um, and the child is, you know, is messing up and, and destroying the toys. And some parents really freak out about that. Rah! You know, can't be doing that. Can't be doing that. That's valuable stuff. 
And, and, and then the child starts, you know, developing phobias and problems and issues around this. The more insistent the parents are that the toys are really important and you can't mess up the toys and you can't do anything with the toys. And the child's like, but I thought they were mine and I thought I should be able to do anything I want to to them because you gave them to me and they're mine. No, they're not really yours, right? Kind of is the message the kid's getting and it's all this weird stuff. It's kind of analogous in that there's all this significance and importance being put on something that really, at the end of the day, isn't really that important. Um, Hubbard kind of considers the whole physical universe, the whole messed universe, to be a playground, a place where you, me, everybody is just kind of messing around. You know, it's a toy box. It's a place where things aren't really that important, really. But we have all sunk down into this position, this viewpoint, this idea that it's ultra important. It's so important. Nothing else could be more important. And Hubbard laughs at that idea. He's like, yeah, yeah, that's what you have to get past. That's what you have to, uh, you know, kind of graduate out of. And that's, again, what becoming OT and operating Thetan is all about. It's going from a childlike state where you're traumatized and hurt And all these bad things are happening to you all the time and you feel powerless and insignificant and completely unable to do anything about it and and graduating to adulthood where you're kind of more in charge and your ability to make decisions and 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 uh, decide what is and isn't important and all that. You know, it's your power of choice now as an adult. Well, as an operating Thetan, it would be the same kind of concept. An OT could grant importance to things, but they realize it's all really just kind of silly because if you can create anything, anytime, anywhere, whenever you want, then suddenly the, the, the importance or significance of a million dollars suddenly doesn't mean so much. Suddenly a billion dollars doesn't mean anything. Suddenly a trillion dollars doesn't mean anything because you can create a trillion, trillion, trillion if you want. You know, that's how you kind of take away the value or importance of anything is you just have so much abundance of it that it doesn't matter anymore. And it's that scarcity of things Hubbard talks about that causes all the all the problems and all the issues. And, you know, and there's certain degrees of, of rightness in some of that. But of course, then it's piled on with all this bullshit about energy flows and about, you know, spirits and all this other nonsense and and, uh, you know, and on and on and on. So, again, you can pick out little kernels of stuff here that might sound useful or significant or important or maybe something you could use in your life. But it's surrounded by all this other complete horseshit that doesn't make any real sense. You know, I, go, I talk about this stuff about energy with uh, electrical engineers and, and physicists and stuff, and they just they just can't stop laughing. They just think this is the most hilarious stuff they've ever heard in their life. So... Anyway, just kind of putting that out there for you that um, that none of this stuff is factual. It's just Hubbard's take on things. But this is where the expression pulling it in comes from. And, and, and this is the whole explanation for it in, you know, in simple kind of layman's terms. But, uh, you know, you try to weld through, you know, you try to kind of weed through Hubbard's stuff on this. And it'll just take you days to to figure this stuff out. Um, so I thought I'd offer a, an easier explanation. And I hope... This easier explanation makes some degree of sense. Did my best here. Hope it, hope it works. Robert Tobias. If you watch videos produced by the Church of Scientology, you can plainly see people being audited in a communal room that appears to be filled with desks right next to each other. Given the fact that auditing requires answering very personal questions, where is the privacy and confidentiality? Great question, Robert. Thank you for this. What you are looking at is a room full of co-auditors. You are looking at a training environment where people are either learning how to audit and they're kind of dummy auditing, they're just practicing it, or they are co-auditing, which is called cooperative auditing, which is where you're not being audited by a professional auditor in the Hubbard Guidance Center area of the church. You're in the training area and you and another student do the class on how to do this level of auditing, and then you cooperate with one another and do it on one another. But when you're doing that kind of auditing, you have to have a course supervisor who is supervising your auditing and stepping in to deal with any 
uh, fixes or repairs or deal with any problems that you or your partner are not yet trained in how to deal with. The supervisor is a higher trained auditor and uh, can step in and actually take over the session for a brief period of time to deal with that problem and then turn it back over to the co-auditor. That's in a nutshell how co-auditing works. And that's how I got through, by the way. That's how all of us got through the RPF program is we were co-auditing in a communal space with supervisors. And uh, I was both a co-auditor in that position and I was a course supervisor on the RPF, stepping in and taking over sessions from time to time when, when needed. You get trained on how to do all that stuff when you're on the RPF. Um, none of that training, by the way, translates outside the RPF. You got to do it all over again when you get off the RPF. The RPF is supposed to be its own little thing, and it's not. Um, it, nobody really takes that training seriously outside the RPF, um, which is kind of weird and ironic, really, because it is the same training and you're doing the exact same procedures. But I just thought I'd let you in on that little secret. Um, but anyway, what you're looking at is co-auditing, okay? And so the rules are a little bit different. And everybody who goes into a co-auditing situation is doing so because they are paying significantly less to get their auditing that way, right? All they got to do is pay for the coursework and uh, pay for the, the folder work to get done. But otherwise, they can just co-audit as much as they want. If they want to go in there and, you know, if the course room is open and the course supervisor is there... They could co-audit from nine in the morning until nine at night, you know, seven days a week if they want and um, get themselves up the bridge to total freedom that way. It was amazing to me, amazing to me when I was in Scientology, how few people ever took that route. I mean, I can literally count on two hands how many people I saw in 27 years of Scientology doing a full co-audit to get up to clear. Hardly ever happens, right? Most Scientologists just want to pay their money and sit in a room one-on-one -on -one with an auditor and get up the bridge fast, 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 right? That's how most Scientologists do it. So that's why you might not have heard so much about this. There you go. David Anderson, can you please give me your opinion about the Episcopal Church? I went on Sundays as a kid and it was great. It was obvious our pastor was kind of gay. He had a nice family, and we all loved them. Then a lady with her significant other at another church in California stirred things up, demanding to be recognized as being gay. The way I remember it, this split the church in two. Can you comment on this? Hey, thanks for this question, David. I think really what you're looking at here are, um, there's a couple different ways we could maybe look at this, but what, what comes to my mind right away is sort of identity issues of group identity versus individual identity and how these things mix. And this is one of those points I like to bring up to people because it's really, it's really been, it's very thought provoking to think about this for a minute, right? Where do you end and the environment around you begins, right, in terms of your identity. Other people think about you and identify you in specific ways. And that's just as much part of your identity as what you think of yourself in, in a, as social creatures. And so we can have these issues and problems where we conflict on our own sense of self versus what's being forced on us or what's being pushed on us or what people think about us. And this is not just reputation. This is full-on identity I'm talking about here, right? It's not just how people think about you. It's who they think you really are. And the, the fact of the matter is that uh, throughout this world, very, very many people have it very fixed in their minds that pastors, priests, men and women of God must not absolutely positively cannot be homosexual or uh, anywhere on the LGBT spectrum. And that is fascinating and something that is changing culturally, but that kind of change is just going to take time. It's a multi-generational kind of change to, you know, be okay with that kind of thing. It's the reality of it is that it's always been there, but the, uh, the association of it with certain identities like priest, nun, pastor, minister, you know, there's a lot of, uh, this, this really blows people's heads up. Because their concepts of what their religion is, what it represents, what it symbolizes, what 
it, what the practices are, what the rules are, right? That, that some people have a very rigid take. Other people have a much more loosey-goosey take. And this is, this is the anatomy of where schisms come from in churches is this identity point or these points of, of practice become so different, become such, so challenging to agree on that people split up. And this is a major, major point in modern society right now, the LGBT question, um, that it causes schisms and problems in churches, right? When people try to blow this up, both in a positive way and a negative way, because people lose their damn minds. But this is just one of, you know, a million different reasons why people have schismed in in groups and broken up is because there's just certain lines they're not willing to cross or certain you know, gives they're not willing to give. I'm not going to give on that point. I'm. This is it. This is the line in the sand, and that's how it is. And so you get that kind of activity. I'm not sure exactly if this is exactly what you were trying to ask about with your question. So if I, if I missed the context of this or I missed what you were looking at, David, feel free to write me on this again. But this is kind of my initial take on this is it's kind of, oh, yeah, that's how people are. And, uh, and they are that way because of you know, identity and group identity versus self-identity, that's a thing. And it might be something for people to think about because it has uh, an awful lot to do with reputation, but it, it's, it's a lot more than that. It has to do with s- social standing and group status and, and also what groups we are and aren't part of or what groups we're willing to acknowledge we're part of and not. And, you know, what, who has a right to what information in my life, how transparent do I need to be? Some people feel they need to be very transparent. Other people feel, hey, it's none of your damn business. Back off and leave me alone. It's it, I, I don't have to tell you anything about myself or my life. And that alone, that point right there can become a bone of contention. So, you know, there's almost anything people can uh, squabble over, disagree over, or, you know, full-blown schism over and even become violent about uh, depending on how committed and emotionally invested they are in those beliefs and ideas. So I don't know. Don't know if this really, you know, gives a lot of enlightenment on this particular point, but uh, it's it's my initial thoughts on it. So uh, there you go. All right, let's do some flash answers. Liam Mullen. In watching the event where David Miscavige announced the death of L. Ron Hubbard, Miscavige said that Hubbard had departed or abandoned his body at 2,000 hours Friday, the 24th of January, A.D. 36. What the heck was he talking about? In A.D. 36, most of the known world was ruled by the Roman Emperor Tiberius. Am I missing something here? Indeed. Within the world of Scientology, there's kind of this, it's not a joke, but it kind of is that the time could be measured after Dianetics, right? A.D., after Dianetics, which means year zero is 1950. And, uh, and Scientology has, and L. Ron Hubbard have, dated things based on the A.D. of after Dianetics. Is it silly? You bet it is. Do Scientologists uniformly comply with it? Hell no, absolutely not, right? They live in the real world, and they have to date things according to the way everybody else is going to understand it. But it's kind of, that's why I say it's kind of this in-joke within Scientology. But it's not really a joke, uh, but it kind of is. You know, that's what I mean. In other words, I never took it seriously, and I never met any other Scientologists who were, you know, rigid or dogmatic on this particular point of AD. But it's there, and, uh, and it's just part of another part of Scientology. Sheila C. I consumed LSD one time. It had no effect on me. Possibly it was really old acid. Possibly it was just a dirty piece of paper that someone sketchy gave me. Regardless, does that make me ineligible for the Sea Org? If you were to insist that it was LSD, then that would absolutely make you ineligible. But if you said what you said here in this question to a recruiter, they would go, oh, okay, well, let, why don't we go ahead and give you a metered interview and find out? Because the meter knows all, right? You as a Thetan know whether that was LSD or not, and the meter is going to tell us. So let's put you on an e-meter. Let's do an ethics interview where we get to ask you lots and lots of questions about your experience. Did you hallucinate? Why did you take it? What were you doing? What happened? Not run you through it like a session. 
ask you about it, get lots and lots of data about it, right? Who gave it to you? What, what exactly did you experience? Um, you know, any side effects, any after effects, anything like that. And if there was nothing and there was nothing and you keep saying, yeah, no, it wasn't. They told me it was, but it wasn't. And they get that fully clarified and the e-meter agrees with the needle floating, then good. Now you get to be in the Sea Org. That's kind of how that works. Adria Vici Haloub. If the Sea Org does not legally exist, how can Sea Org members be considered the clergy of Scientology by a court of law? If the Sea Org does not legally exist, how can the court honor priest penitent privilege? I heard that the penitent party can waive their right to priest penitent privilege so a priest's testimony can be allowed in a court of law. Is this true? Can the priest still refuse to testify if the penitent waives their right? Okay, so uh, really fast, it is not the sea organization that is the religious body of Scientology. It is its various corporations which have religious tax exemption and religious recognition in the courts. Okay, it is the Church of Scientology International and the various subunits of Scientology, each one its own corporate entity, that are recognized as religious bodies. And that means the American St. Hill Organization, the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles, the Continental Liaison Office of the Western United States, East U.S., etc., all of those are independent corporate bodies which are recognized as religious entities and have tax exemption. That's where they get their religious exemption from, not the Sea Org. The Sea Org is the faux brother, you know, fraternal organization that has no real legal um, existence. But it doesn't have to in order for them to have religious uh, recognition. Now, in terms of the second part of your question, I, I don't I don't know. I have no idea. And I don't, I'm not a legal scholar enough to be able to answer that question off the top of my head as to whether a priest can waive their right to confidentiality uh, or the penitent can. I don't think I don't think they can. Um, uh, but I'm not sure. We'd have to ask a lawyer about that one, Adria, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry I did not do that before I answered you here. So I'm just going to punt and say I don't think that's a thing. I, I don't think they can do that. But let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. Okay, that's our show for this week, guys. Uh, short, sweet, to the point. I wanted to give you guys some, uh, some rapid-fire answers here that I hope give you uh, entertaining, informative, and educational answers anyway, especially in that whole pulling it in thing. Uh, I don't think I've ever explained that whole thing anywhere. I don't know anybody has, actually. So hope that works for you. And uh, as always, I will say i got to promote out here at the end that I do professional consultations. If you guys need help, if you are looking for assistance of any kind in regards to a coercive control situation, or recovery from, or trying to help somebody maybe out of a cultic situation. You got a family or a friend or something who's kind of caught up in something. You're not quite sure exactly what to say or do, or how to act, or what to you know how to be. Give me give me a call. Give me a contact. Let's uh, let's talk. Right. I can offer you some uh, some professional consultation on that matter. And also, of course, I want to remind everybody this show is one thousand percent fan funded the only reason this thing keeps going is because of you guys seriously so if you are enjoying my channel enjoying the content then please consider supporting me uh even a little bit a uh, dollar a month even through patreon paypal venmo links below uh in the description section of every one of my videos uh allow you to support this channel and i hope you will do so with all that i will see you guys next week bye bye <laughs>